appreciate you inviting me here to share some of my experience of innovation with you. Uh, at the same time, I of course want to learn from you because you guys are actually practicing it on the ground. You're doing it in practice. Uh, so it's all about knowledge sharing and also helping me to document the good things that you're doing. Um, I recently wrote this book on frugal innovation. I've got a copy with me. So while I'm talking, if you'd like to have a quick read through of it, so please welcome to do that. So um, the basic question, you know, that I ask with frugal innovation is how can Pakistan, of course, benefit from this phenomena? So let me tell you something about the phenomena itself. So innovation actually is broader than entrepreneurship. You know, in Pakistan, I started uh, uh, my own company back in the early 2000s. There was huge hype about entrepreneurship. Uh, and alongside, one of my colleagues asked me to start teaching entrepreneurship to others while I was practicing it. But actually, you know, 10 years moving on beyond that, I think the world has moved up beyond entrepreneurship into innovation. Because innovation is more broader than entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship is, as I see it, it's the start of the journey. It's the, the fact that you are setting up your venture and enterprise or an organization, but then there's lots of other things you've got to do with that organization, the enterprise, right? You've got to actually uh, have processes in place that will help you to continually improve and grow and make it sustainable. So that's where innovation plays a role. Big companies are, of course, much more passionate about innovation than they are about entrepreneurship. Yes, they've got entrepreneurship, they've got some people spinning out uh, different ventures from within their large company, which you call entrepreneurship. But what I want you to perhaps acknowledge is that innovation is much broader, it's more encompassing, and therefore I think more interesting, that's what I would argue. So the interesting questions we ask in innovation are broadly, what are the sources of innovation? Who does it? Yeah, coming back to that question of is it entrepreneurs that are good at doing innovation? Is it large corporations? You know, this is a fundamental question that Schumpeter, who we call the prophet of innovation, asked a hundred years ago and in fact he changed his mind throughout his career first he thought it was entrepreneurs then he thought it was large corporations then he went back I think to entrepreneurs so we still don't have the answer then there's the question of okay where does it come from in terms of geographical location is it developed countries or developing countries and that's that's where I think I'm going to help you to uh, understand where I position frugal innovation I won't go into the second question of how do you do it because that's a very lengthy topic. Uh, but I will touch upon the outcomes of the innovation. What's the result of it? Who does it benefit? Is it primarily to create profits for investors or does it fundamentally change lives for the better? So w when I started looking at this phenomena, it was, you know, and, and there are many different wordings for it. People call it grassroots, inclusive, frugal, reverse, jugard. Uh, frugal engineering, bottom of the pyramid innovation, cost innovation, extreme affordability as the Stanford University likes to call it. But you can see all these terminologies really grew phenomenally from 2008-2009, so about the last 10 years. So let me share with you, um, this is a list of my publications, right? So if you're interested in the topic beyond this presentation, do have a look at the publications and read up on them. Um, so we're going to try and understand what this phenomena is. What are these frugal innovations by looking at some examples and relate them to human, social and economic development. And finally, I want to share with you and get some of your ideas. How can we actually promote this here in Pakistan? I think the growth of this phenomena can be explained for by these three uh, activities that's been happening over the last two decades. Number one is the growth of R&D centers from the developed countries to the developing countries. Number two is the growth of emerging markets. And number three is this idea that you should also produce products for the poor, bottom of the pyramid. So this is a chart which shows you a little bit about, you know, as China being an example, in the last 10 years, the number of R&D centers have doubled. And even though China is the second largest economy now, it's still classified, interestingly, as a developing nation. So, but it's an emerging market, a huge emerging market. 
So there was a book written about this phenomena by a person from the World Bank. And so the green countries are the emerging markets, and you know the famous ones of Brazil, Russia, India, China being the most populous and the ones that have had high sustain, uh, have sustained high growth rates over many, many years. But thankfully, we Pakistani, you know, Pakistanis are also on the map as the next 11, the Goldman Sachs terminology. So if you were a business person, right? I mean, all of you are. You're striving to become a business person, entrepreneur. Fundamental question you'll probably ask when you chart out your business plan or your business model canvas or you're writing it down on a little tissue, tish, piece of tissue paper, where are you going to do business? Where are you going to locate yourself and then approach the market segment you want to um, sell items to? So one idea is, well, you tackle the top 10 economies of the world because they're the richest right, in terms of wealth. The other idea is that why not tap the 30 plus trillion market of the bottom of the pyramid and masses of people that earn less than whatever $20, $10 a day? So that's the emerging markets. So now these are the most populous nations. Not the most wealthy, but the most populous, the top 10. So if you put this in comparison, the G7, right, the world's wealthiest nations contribute about half the world's GDP in terms of wealth. So that's a great place for you to do business, right, because that's where the money is. But it's the usual suspects the countries that have been around for, you know, developed countries for the last full century. On the other hand, you could say, well, I want to do business in emerging markets. So the E7, the most populous nations here, China, India, Indonesia, Brazil, Pakistan being the number fifth here. And with the population growth rate of 2.1% thereabouts, in another 10 years or so, we'll actually surpass Brazil and Indonesia to become the third most populous nation in the world. But even though we contribute only about half of the world's GDP uh, in comparison to what the contribution of the G7 is, right? So if it's an $80 trillion world economy, our share of it is about 25%. Right? Uh, but our share of the world's population is more than half. So if you just think about, on the one hand, you can be an Apple, Steve Jobs, you create an iPhone for a thousand dollars, or an Apple iPad, uh, iMac uh, book, um, laptop for a thousand dollars, and you sell that in the G7 nations as your first market entry, and then you hope that it will, you know, trickle down to the rest of the world. Or you could be the Acers and the Asus's of Taiwan, and say, I'm going to sell in Taiwan, I'm going to sell in Vietnam, in Cambodia, in my surrounding regions, and then in China, and then in Pakistan. But now I'm going to create these laptops for $200. But I can still potentially have the same number of revenues because there's five times the number of people living in the emerging markets, right? So instead of selling one in the G7, Apple, you sell five of these in the developing markets. So theoretically, actually, you could make as much money by tackling the needs of the more lower, middle, and middle class uh, market segment. So for you as a businessman, it doesn't matter, right? Your main goal is to maximize profits for your shareholders. So it doesn't matter when you do business, developed or developing nations. So with that, of course, then Prahalad comes in and says, you know, why not actually make money out of the poor? Because it will also increase the livelihoods and, this, and the, the lifestyles of the, of the poor. So the idea here is that it's the grassroots innovation. If you want to produce items for the poor, then you need to get them involved. Get them involved in solving their own problems. Because they are experiencing them day in, day out. So instead of just having engineers and you know, educated people in universities creating products for the poor or for the rich, you actually need to have the bottom of the pyramid involved in the innovation process so that they produce products for themselves. So with this idea, then this, you know, the General Electric has picked up on that, and so it created R&D centers in the developing world to get them involved. And what they're saying now is that instead of the standard flow of innovation from the west to the east, you might actually have the potential of diffusing innovations that have been created by their R&D centers in the developing world back into the west. So reverse innovation. But I'll give you an example of that soon. 
And with this, you know, another terminology picked up. This is a war of words, right? Among scholars, among consultants working for Ernst & Young, Deloitte, McKinsey. So they're basically trying to get their own brand out there. So one of my dear friends, Jaidee Prabhu at Cambridge University, I've written papers with him as well and gone to conferences. He wrote this in about 2012 called Jugard Innovation, right? And you guys know what that is. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Quick and dirty solutions for an immediate urgent problem. This is a little WhatsApp image that somebody sent me. And you know, you look at these WhatsApp images and you either delete them or forward them. And I said, oh my god, I can actually use that as an example. I think it's somewhere from Pakistan. What's happening here? India. India, okay. I use this in my PowerPoint. Oh, excellent. So great, great people think alike, huh? Excellent. So what is this, uh, Masood Sahib? Uh, room cooler for two. Room cooler for two people, right? I mean, I as a kid used to see this in my khala and chacha's house, you know. But I never s figured that you could actually put a baggy shalwar on it and then make it more efficient and more equitable, isn't it? Because now these two roommates can have equitable distribution of this cool air. And it's more efficient. How is it, Imtiaz uh, How is it more efficient? Yes. But I think it's also efficient because it means that the air that was blowing and hitting this big wall in the middle and was just being dispersed is not happening anymore. So pretty smart if you fundamentally think about it. Of course, the problem with this Jugard innovation is that as soon as your mother-in-law comes to your home, knocks on the door, you're like, okay, take that thing down. You know, I'm not going family. Similarly, this is something that Imtiaz sent, Imtiaz Saab sent me on WhatsApp, uh, I think maybe a month ago. And I love this video because I think it's from Pakistan, is it, sir? <coughs> So what's happening here, guys? An immediate problem. Again, it's efficiency. He's actually doing... So this is the definition I have for frugal energy. To do more with less. Right? But for many people. I'll come to that. But he's doing more with less. He's using his local resources that don't cost them anything. And he's made the process much more quicker and efficient. But if he went to Massey Ferguson, I think, which is situated on Shekhapura Road between Lahore and Shekhapura, if he went to Massey Ferguson, what do you think they would try to sell him? Probably a 5-ton, 10-ton huge contraption which then he has to bolt onto his tractor. And it will be expensive and it will also mean that he will spend more fuel uh, doing the same job. But again, it's a great idea, great creative thinking, but it's Jugaad. The issue now is, he probably knows many other hundred farmers in the village who face the same problem. But he can't sell them this idea. It's not commercially viable. That's where I argue that frugal innovation comes in. So Jugard is a great starting point to be creative and think about a quick and dirty solution. But then you need to have proper innovation processes in place that you co-partner. So let the grassroots people co-partner with you guys, you know, the engineers, the designers. The, the doctors and, and you know the business acumen people who can then transform this into a commercially viable product. So I've looked at many many examples around the world of all places I went to Stanford and Santa Clara to find these examples but you might be surprised why did I go to Silicon Valley to find these low cost examples it was because they actually convene they have a challenge right they have an annual challenge where they invite people and identify people from around the world and bring them together in Silicon Valley so they work together with the Stanford engineers, the Silicon Valley venture capitalists, you know, to help them to scale up their enterprise. So that brings us to the next, let's share some examples of how these examples are actually helping to transform human lives as well as improving economic development. So when, when people ask me what is frugal innovation, you know, I say look, the best thing, the best way to know what is frugal innovation is to understand what it is not. See, that's the basic kind of approach we use in the sciences. That you can't actually prove something, you can only show that it hasn't been disproven. Uh, 
So, I mean, you know, let, let's move on with that. So, I had a hypothesis. I said, if you want to only spend low amounts of money, then common sense will tell you that you should expect low performance from the investment you're making. If you want high performance, then you should be ready to chunk out the, 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 the amount of money that's needed for that high performance, right? Well, frugal innovators are deliberately challenging themselves all the time to position themselves here in this quadrant where they say, no, we want to provide something with really high quality, high performance, and low cost. So they kept coming back to me and said, do not call us cheap. We're not about cheap innovation. We're not about low quality. And I said, okay, can you give me some evidence? So I came across this startup which spun out of a collaboration between Stanford engineers and an NGO based in India. So what they did was they went to India and they saw that there, this NGO was equipping people with these low cost, cheap, uh, jugar kind of uh, prosthetic knee joints for amputees. Issue with this is, you know, it doesn't give you a respectable way of life. You know, it's almost painful to use these prosthetic limbs and knee joints. In the developed world, you've got these microcontrolled, pneumatically, you know, reinforced titanium, uh, reinforced polycentric, whatever, you know, microcontrolled chips, blah, blah, blah. At 10,000 US dollars, but very high performance. But who's, who can afford this? Probably the US military for their Iraq vet veterans. Not available to the masses. So these engineers out of Stanford force themselves to, you know, understand the needs of the local population how they were solving it through Jugard methods, and then bring it to the next frugal innovation step. And they created this very high performance multi axial prosthetic knee joint at a fraction of the cost. At the time they were injection molded it, now currently they were started to use 3D printing because it's even cheaper to do 3D printing than injection molding. Anyway, this you can see with my hypothesis nicely overlays with this diagram. By the way, this is a diagram they created, it's not mine, right? used with their permission. So I was struck that the diagram nicely overlays with my hypothesis that yes, you can create something which is frugal innovation, which is very high performance at a fraction of the cost. This thing is now being sold in I don't know how many countries around the world and it's, you know, current price is $60. Ten years later, it's still in business. I was at the time marked as one of the 50 best inventions of the year by Time magazine. So that was a startup, right? Uh, there's local entrepreneurs that are doing this in transportation. Another trigger for frugal innovation. So while rich people in the developing world might be able to afford a Mercedes, most people actually only get around like this. I think you must have seen this, right? This is a picture I took in Karachi recently where this person on a scooter bike has basically got a family of how many? One, two, three, four, Five? Incorrect. Because as I was in my Korean car speeding towards south, uh, was it um, uh, uh, the beach, uh, this person overtook, sped up and overtook my Korean car, think, thinking about, you know, his family. Moved to my right hand side when I had already taken the picture and, the, and I was surprised to see the lady was holding a two month old baby. <laughs> I agree with you, sir. It, it, you know, but there's no helmets. He's got little kids on his bike, and, and I've got three daughters of my own. My youngest is seven months old, and I don't. I would never allow her to ride on a motorbike like that. So anyway, one of the local entrepreneurs, Ratan Tata, chairman of the you know large engineering corporation there challenged his engineers to come up with a car that is affordable for the masses. And so the price point that he gave to his engineers was 100,000 rupees. Why 100,000? Because the idea here is that if somebody can afford a 50,000 rupee motorbike, then the jump to a car for 100,000 shouldn't be too much significant. And it gives them a huge, you know, boost into moving into the lower or middle class. So they came up with different innovations to redesign the car and came up with this in 2008 and they launched it at the International um, Car Show in Geneva. So the thing about this car was, I mean it looks pretty 
cool, right? It looks aesthetically pleasing and 100,000 rupees. But the thing about this car was that it triggered this phenomenon of how a little car can teach the world to think big. So don't just create products and services for the rich and famous and the powerful. Create products for the common person. Grassroots people are doing this. Right? This is an uh, Israeli engineer that's come up with a bicycle for $10 made out of cardboard and recycled rubber. This is a Palestinian doctor who was doing the philanthropic work in uh, Gaza and there was a, a blockage through by Israel on Gaza. So he was unable to import any medical devices but thankfully he had a 3D printer with him. So he created his own little stethoscope using local resources and materials. That's grassroots. But now think about General Electric, large multinational corporation, right? One of the top five. Their business models always being create these high-end, sophisticated, uh, very expensive ECG or ultrasound machines. But they discovered that their R&D lab in India, by looking at the needs of the local population, miniaturized the ECG machine into this compact form. And also notice that it has very few buttons. Because then here, what it means is that a community health worker can easily use this and you don't need to be an MBBS doctor to use that ECG machine. It's using open source software, it's using off-the-shelf components like the credit card printing uh, machine. And they've made that ECG available everywhere, you know, at a fraction of the cost. And when I say everywhere, that's generally everywhere because what they found to their surprise was that they imported that machine into the American market. And now what they're doing in, the, in America was that they're equipping every clinic, every rural clinic, as well as all ambulances with that miniature machine. So economies of scale, right? Instead of just sending a high-end one machine to a hospital. Well, it's moved beyond that. That was 10 years ago. right? This is a startup that's now leveraging the fact that everybody's got a smartphone in their pocket, even in the developing world. To use a little biosensor to measure your ECG um, in real time. And you use AI software to actually trigger a warning that, oh, something's about to go wrong, you need to go to the doctor immediately. There's people using smartphone technologies. I have a friend working out of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. He's on a mission to provide these smart to provide these little attachments. It's got a specific lens on it which makes it basically an ophthalmoscope. Uh, uh, yes? Ophthalmoscope. Yes, very good, sir. Thank you. And so now, teachers in Kenya, Uganda, and these African nations are just using this attachment to say, oh, you know, in the classroom, I see this little boy or girl, and they're squinting in class, they're complaining of headaches, and they can't really learn in class, their performance is not well. Maybe it's a problem with their eyesight. So instead of waiting for a doctor to come by to the village every maybe six months, you've got real-time diagnostics at a fraction of the cost. Uh, even the Queen of the UK gave this little startup a huge innovation award because it promoted access to healthcare for the masses. So there's so many little examples. Let me give you just one more, uh, maybe a couple more. What, what, what's this? What's this? A person transporting what? Coke crates, right? Interestingly enough, the best distribution channel is owned by Coca-Cola. You'll find Coca-Cola virtually everywhere. Even when you can't have mineral water, clean drinking water, you'll find a Coke bottle. So this entrepreneur, you know, startup like you guys, he said, you know, number one killer for babies under five is diarrhea. And this ORS, uh, oral rehydration uh, salts, are not available in mass, vast uh, communities of Africa and the developing world. So how can I get these oral salts to the people? You know, UNICEF, World Bank is donating all of this stuff all around. But how do you actually complete the last mile so that it gets to where it's needed? So he designed a packaging for the ORS which nicely slots into the empty spaces between the Coke bottles. You see, so a little cone-shaped packaging. Nothing really spectacularly innovative in terms of, you know, the product, the medicine, or anything like that. But it's a kit. 
it's a kid that just gets freely transported through an existing distribution channel. It's very simple, right? That's the thing about frugal innovations and doesn't really cost much. Are you okay with those examples? Shall we, uh, I think, what's the time now, Ms. Husa? Okay, let me just quickly, I think hopefully in five minutes I'll finish. This is one that I'm currently working on. We identified this innovation in Uganda and Malawi. And the NHS in England is under huge budget deficits. So they are under a lot of pressure to save money. So the number three, uh, the, 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 um, the, set, the subsector in the, U, in the NHS which costs them the most in terms of surgical practices is musculoskeletal disease. And this is a core kit that is used by orthopedic surgeons. The thing about this unfortunately is that this drill costs 30 US dollars or about 23,000 pounds. Because you can basically bake this in a sterilizer autoclave at 130 degrees and bake it for 30 minutes, it will still operate with the battery. That's the sophistication in it. But you can't afford that in the developing world. So in the developing world, what these clinicians saw, these surgeons saw, was that the standard hardware drill, which we use to just pin up our frames and, and pictures, are abundantly available. And more so, the clinical and the hardware drills have the same speed, same torque, also lightweight, actually have longer lasting batteries, provide longer life, and is a fraction of the cost. And when I interviewed a lot of these clinicians, orthopedic surgeons, they said, you know, actually using the hardware drill is easier because it's more ergonomically designed for mass use. And so what these clinicians were doing while they were wrapping the hardware drill with a sterile cover, and the key here is this adapter unit. So this adapter unit provides le level 5 barrier control to any kinds of pathogens that might come in or out. Because this drill is fundamentally dirty, right? So you can't just take it into the clinical room. But if you wrap it with this sterile cover, you can take it into the clinical room. That's the innovation, right? Pretty simple. Nothing really drastic about it. But compare that 30,000 US dollars to a few couple of hundred US dollars. So my economic modeling with my colleagues suggests that if the NHS adopts this innovation, they'll save 115 million pounds. Huge amounts, which they can reinvest somewhere else. And this company is selling this device to 32 developing countries. And they've done more than something like 60,000 surgeries. So another frugal innovation, you can see that has the potential of being transported from the developing world to the developed world. And where was it identified? From needs in the developing world. We're doing it in Pakistan. I think Malik Riaz was on a mission at the time in 2008 to have these Awami villas. Um, when I interviewed some people in Beria town, they suggested to me that these villas are actually sold at cost. But why were they selling these at the time? I think for 5 lakh rupees. Because they needed the servants, the maids, the gardeners, the drivers to be able to live close to the people they want to attract into their communities which are generally developed far away from the cities. But how do they then next make money is because they make money from the real estate, the commercial real estate that will cater to these Awami villas. So they don't make money from the houses themselves but from the complementary services that are provided. It's being done in services like microfinance, Mohammed Yunus and the Grameen Bank. So it's not just about products, it's about services. Our famous Dr. Amjad Saqib with the Huwat has been doing this at 0% finance. So let me come to conclusion for this, right? What, what lessons can we have for Pakistan? Let me just quickly go over this, I don't think there's much time. It's the youth energy, right, which we see in this room as well. There's a youth bulge in the country and if you channelize the energy of the youth properly, it really means we, this population dividend can pay off in the future. We've got lots of needs in the country. You know, everywhere we go, I was uh, discussing with the director of R&D. Uh, so we've got so many needs here. I think you know, if you and I went on an expedition for just 10 minutes around here in the plaza, took our little scrapbook and said, can you identify problems that need to be fixed? I think we'll have a hundred in five or ten minutes. So problems are just right there waiting for us to solve. 
But we need to solve them. Look, nobody from outside is going to come and identify those problems and solve them for us. We need to take the step, first step of doing the jugard process of having some kind of solution. And I think that in the villages and the rural areas, a lot of this is happening. I went to NRSP yesterday, and I was struck when I presented to them. They actually came back during discussion session and said, look, I took a picture of this villager doing this. I took a picture of this. And they're already doing this. They don't call it frugal innovation. You know, smart people like you call it frugal innovation, but they do it as a form of practice. But we need to celebrate that. We need to, you know, make them heroes of our nation. We need to bring those grassroots mechanics, engineer, you know, little uh, uh, um, uh, locksmiths, blacksmiths into our universities to work with you guys in these incubators to, for you to then help them to take it to the next level. That's where I have, I, my, a lot of my work suggests that the most successful frugal innovations that have diffused around the world have been those that have been developed in co-partnership with developed countries. So you bring in the Stanford, you bring in the Imperial College people, you know, and have them work with you through internships, challenges, or uh, makeathons. Only then can you export these items to the rest of the world. Right? I mean, I'm not discounting blockchain and cryptocurrency and all of these, you know, fancy new technologies. Certainly, we can leverage those. But unless we solve our basic problems, come up with our own solutions, and then scale them up to the local economy, only then can we make it exportable to the rest of the world. So that's where I basically conclude, and I'm looking forward to your feedback on how we can actually do this. And I'm sure you're doing this already. Thank you.